Let me say good morning to you again. It is 1038. We have six or seven minutes until we begin our morning worship, which begins at 1045. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith, and I'm the pastor of New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church. I pray that everyone has, at least in those brief moments, had a chance to kind of refill your coffee cups, to uh, do a couple of things, and uh, to get back settled and join us again as we get ready to go into God's Word. I'm going to be in the Old Testament. Uh, we have a sermon series entitled, Watch What You Say. And we've been talking about the power of words, uh, being careful what you say. Uh, if you don't know anything, you can't say anything. And just being very mindful of our speech. I think that's a reminder that all of us could stand to be refreshed on a principle that we can all use some further study and examination on if you're anything like me. I appreciate you coming back. I appreciate you sharing with us. I appreciate you being back here with us again. And so as you log on, we'll just say good morning to you. Say good morning to everyone. If you so desire, we'd love to have at least a brief way of fellowshipping, at least in this way uh, virtually. Uh, Sister Jackie Brown, good morning to you. Good to have you with us as well as Sister Carolyn Turner. I hope everybody in your home and your family is doing fine. Uh, you will see here soon, I was one half a second away from doing the uh, Sunday school lesson outside this morning. It was just a little too windy, but I know that's not a change that's going to remain. It will be some very hot and humid days, even at nine o'clock in the morning. So I'm looking forward to getting outside and uh, to being out there with nature. Uh, to Brother Tidwell, man, I appreciate you so much. I thank the Lord for you. Good to have you with us again. Uh, trying to make sure I don't have any more technical difficulties and everything is lined up. Um, I, I can say this just as we get kind of together and get logged on. Uh, to the Milam family, good morning to you, Brother Tom and Kim. Um, let me say this to you. This forum of the virtual streams where we are not uh, in church, but we're virtually teaching and preaching and learning and worshiping and sharing and greeting each other. Sister Halton, good morning to you. This, this forum has served me well in this sense. Although I miss people, you, you just miss the human connection, the human contact. It has given me more of a tunnel vision on the word of God. And what I mean is there is no pomp and circumstance when we get on here. To the Tim's family, good morning to you as well. Uh, to the Abrams family, good morning to you. Uh, there's no bathroom pauses. Uh, there's no long altar calls or altar call songs. There's no choir songs. There's no announcements. There's no getting up and walking around and people come. It is log on, get to work. Log on, get the Bible. For the most part, we have a brief discussion, but for the most part, you log on and you get straight to the teaching and to the preaching. And that in itself, it is a good thing. In the sense of, I believe it has helped me, and I'm sure maybe some others. I'm sure it's helped others to know that the main thing is the main thing. And the main thing is the Word of God. In my estimation, at least in my perspective for me as a minister, it has helped me to put a focus on the Word of God. Like, nothing takes priority over that. And so I've been, I've been blessed through it. I felt like I've grown a lot through it. Because, and I feel like maybe some of you have grown as well. Because when you log on to a stream, if you don't want the word, you ain't logging on. Because there is no singing, there is no I'm gonna see this or see that. There is no extras. If you don't want the Bible, and all we giving is the Bible, you're probably not gonna be here. Or, or you know, it could be somebody else's teaching. But even then, for the most part. Most of the streams that I have seen from my sample size experience, hey, they get on there, they, they may have a song, they may not. But I'll tell you this, listen, when they get on there, they go right to the Bible. And there's a song, you know, that it seems like when someone says that they're about to sing, don't they? But there's a song that says, I've been through too much. Oh, wait a minute. 
Sister Betty Bold and a happy birthday. Thank you for that, Sister T uh, Turner. So let's wish Sister Bolden a happy birthday. Put some clapping hands on there. And happy birthday for Sister Betty Bolden. Thank the Lord for that. Another year God has blessed her with. And listen, she can sing the song too. I've been through too much not to worship him. <laughs> I've been through too much. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through. But I can tell you this. God will see you through. So yet again, I want to remind everyone, uh, Lord willing, on next Sunday, the 18th, we'll be at New Hope Baptist Church. Uh, I'll be the main speaker for Pastor Tim's and his family. They are going to be celebrating uh, three years of being at New Hope. And I can just see the Lord just blessing and blessing and blessing him and his family and blessing that church. It seems like a happy reunion. It seems like a beautiful fellowship they have one with another as it should be. Now, because the time of the service is at 10 a.m., I do want to encourage those who are comfortable getting out, and if you're free, to come out and to be with us. It will be spaced out. It will be outside. Uh, I'm not sure the exact setup. You can be in your cars, or some are kind of in chairs on the outside. But because it's at 10 a.m., that's right in the middle of our 930 Sunday school and our 1045 morning worship. And so let me say to you that we won't be having our personal Sunday school or our morning worship next Sunday. But I will encourage you, if not to be there in person, if you're not comfortable with that, to please spend that time uh, logging on and streaming with us. That way you'll be a part, at least in type of that service. And so I, I appreciate your time. Uh, it is 1045. The only way to teach people to be on time is to begin on time. So let's start right now at 1045. If you can pause for a moment, let's have a word of prayer as we go into the word of God. Father, thank you for all of your goodness. Thank you for an early rise. Thank you for a peaceful rest. Thank you for keeping us safe when our minds were not alert and aware. And Father, we ask you right now, we thank you in advance for giving us your word and for what you're going to do with your word. We pray that as we go through this series of messages entitled Watching What We Say, to be mindful of how we speak, to be mindful of passing on the wrong information. If we don't know not to speak, Father, all of these principles are pivotal. They are important. They're fundamental. Help us to tame this tongue with your help. And Father, I pray for clarity. I pray for power. I pray for strength. I pray for the maturity to be able to rightly divide your word. And I pray, I pray for your people. I pray that they will be able to learn your word, not just to hear it, but to heed it. For the ones who are suffering, give them comfort. For the ones who are mountain top, on the mountaintop, give them a thankful spirit. For the ones who are in the valley, give them hope and encouragement and strength of character. Help us all, Father, to get stronger and closer to you. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen and amen. Let me tell you, just as we begin, we're going to be in Numbers chapter 20. Uh, we'll be in verse 10 and verse 11. But let me tell you, just as we begin, that um, I am thankful to God for the saints of New Haven. I thank God for all of you. Uh, the experiences that we have shared, uh, God chose a church and a preacher to put together and I thank the Lord for all of you. I pray all of you are safe. I hope that all of you are doing well. Still understanding that living in this sinful world brings about a certain set of hardships. Sometimes we make our own mistakes, as we said in the morning Sunday school lesson. But there are other times that trouble just comes our way as a result of living in a fallen world. But rest assured, we have a God that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. Above all, that we can add, above all that we can ask or think about. So I want to ask you to, to if you can, uh, this is just integrity. If you're able to or not, you know, no one's watching, just you and the Lord. But if you can, get your Bibles. If you don't have the physical Bible, you want to use an electronic device, laptop, iPad, phone, whatever. Look at these scriptures with me. And as usual, the only way to properly exegete scripture, 
The only way to arrive at proper hermeneutics is context, context, context. So we will have to look at other verses uh, leading up to these two verses. But turn to the Old Testament book of Numbers, and let's look at Numbers chapter 20, and we're going to examine just two verses, verses 10 and verse 11. Numbers 20, verses 10 and 11. I'm going to read this. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we fetch water, fetch you water out of this rock? You can, you can hear the disdain, the aggravation. You can hear the frustration in his voice. You can hear the anger in his voice. Rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lift up his hand, not to pray, <laughs> not to praise. He lifted up his hand and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their beast also. Now verse 10 is kind of our key verse. This doesn't sound very uh, kind, what he says. Hear now, you rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Then he hits the rock twice and water comes out. So we'll, we'll put this in con uh, context. But as we look at these verses, um, we want to talk about hush until you heal. Hush until you heal. I think... I think everyone has been there. We've all said something out of context, not out of context, but more specifically, I think we've all said some things that when we look back with a calmer mind, with a better demeanor, we wish we would have said it differently or not said anything at all. And as I begin just going through this study, this particular passage and this, even this chapter, that this is a... Um, a discipline of mine that God has helped me with over the years. The discipline that I have prayed for is the wisdom of just wanting to be quiet. When it gets to a point to where the conversation gets unreasonable or where I can tell the emotional temperature is getting high to where we're not even talking about the subject at hand, it it kind of gets personal. I try with all in me. I try. I say try because I failed before. But I try with all in me to bring it back in line. To at least find a point of uh, agreement. And sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes, and it takes two people to arrive at that point. But sometimes you just can't do that. And I thank the Lord for the wisdom to when the water gets hot and the situation gets bad and I can see where well, there's nothing I'm going to say to change their mind on whatever the subject is or whatever. And it gets a bit contentious. It gets prickly. I've learned to just shut up. And, and, and that, that's difficult because it gives the other person in this quote unquote verbal confrontation, verbal competition, verbal disagreement. It gives the other person I've sensed kind of a feeling of I shut him down or I won. And that alone to your carnal part of you, the flesh, it makes you want to say, no, 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 you hadn't. There's not a win loss. No, no, no. I, there's a lot more I could say, but I thank God for the discipline, the strength, the wisdom to know to shut up. Because sometimes you're not going to dig your way out of this hole. You're only going to make the hole deeper. And that came across in what Moses should have done in this situation. And I'm sure people listening to me now, I know I'm not the only one who's been there. I know that some of you have said things that needed to be said and needed to be said directly. There is a time for that. But then when you mix everything together, if you're honest and you reflect over your life, 
reminding yourself that we are all fallible, sinful human beings. I'm sure in your own integrity, you look back at a situation when there's nobody but you and the Lord and the ceiling fan above your head. And you say, I shouldn't have said that. I, I shouldn't have continued that. I could have stopped that if I just would have been quiet or that never would be occurring if I just would have held my peace. And that's where we find Moses right here. And we know who Moses is. He's the great emancipator of Egypt. Uh, we're on the heels of Easter Sunday, last Sunday. And I'm sure some of you saw the old Charlton Hesp, uh, Heston, I think it is, you know, the original when he went before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. I'm sure we, it's a classic. We're not concerned about the special effects. We're not concerned about how it doesn't compare visually to new movies. That's just something that takes you back to childhood. I know it does to me. And when he went in there with the robe on and the beard and said, God said, let my people go. That's the Moses that we're talking about on this morning. He's one of the most prominent figures in the Old Testament. He always was a great man of duty. He always was a great man of faith. And although he was a man of service, he was faithful to God. He was a man that was a dutiful man. He still is a man. He's a fallible man. Paul says it this way in the book of Acts, that we are men of like passions. In other words, meaning we bleed, we cry, we do good, and sometimes we do wrong. And I want to put my kickstand down just to, just to labor on that point a little bit. Don't take yourself too serious. Don't think that you're above making mistakes. Don't think that sometimes you don't get it wrong. And not just in the pews, even in the pulpit. Don't take ourselves too seriously. Guess what? Somebody can have an idea that's just as good or better than yours. You thought you should do one thing and doing it another way was the better way. Sometimes we just make mistakes. And that's all of us. And here we see Moses making a mistake, a deliberate mistake, but a mistake nonetheless. In Numbers 20, this particular chapter, this chapter outlines some hard times for Moses. The chapter is bracketed with death. The beginning we have death in the chapter. In the end, we have death in the chapter. In the beginning of the chapter, it begins with the death of his sister, his older sister, Miriam. At the end of the chapter, it ends with the death of his brother, his brother Aaron, who was his spokesman. And I can imagine when death occurs, you have a whole lot of thoughts in your mind. And in the case of Moses, I'm sure Moses had a bunch of mixed emotions, a bunch of thoughts that were good and a bunch of thoughts with his sister and brother that were not so pleasant. Yesterday, we celebrated National Siblings Day. And I can imagine, imagine if Moses was alive, he would have posted pictures of him and Moses, of him and Aaron, him and his sisters, him, them together, them swimming, them doing things. But now in this chapter, it begins with his sister dying. It ends with his brother's dying, his brother dying. And you can imagine because of his history with them, I'm sure he thought about the good and also the stuff that was not so good. It was in Numbers chapter 12 to where his own sister criticized his marriage to this Ethiopian woman. It was in Exodus chapter 32 to where his own brother tried to usurp the authority of leadership and say, I tell you what, since Moses is probably dead, he's been gone too long, and, 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 and I, I, I kind of feel like I'm ready to fill his shoes now. Bring me all of your items. We'll melt them down and make a golden cow. Moses is done with, now it's my turn to take over. The point being, Moses now has to deal with the death, at least by the context of the text, by chapter, verse 10 and 11, he's dealing with the death of his sister. By the end of the chapter, he'll be dealing with the death of a brother and a sister. And so what we have here in Numbers 20, it's the last year of their wandering. It's the last year of them wandering in circles in the wilderness. It's the last year of them walking around in a circle. In verse 1 of Numbers 20, it just kind of sets the date. 
It lets us know that the children of Israel and the whole congregation, they are in the desert of Zen, hot climate, humid climate, climate, desert climate. They're in the desert. It's the first month. And then while they're in Kadesh, it says his sister died. And then in verses two and three, we see a familiar situation. We see that there is a shortage of water for the congregation. Verse two and three says there was no water for the congregation and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And when the people chose, that is, they argued, they complained, they spurned, they fought, as it were, with Moses. They spake saying, would God, we wish to God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. This water shortage, it is difficult. The pressure is mounting when you have a hot climate and you have no water. Of course, naturally, if you're in a hot climate and you don't have water, that can equal your destruction. And right on cue, what did they do again? The people came down hard on Moses and Aaron. Now, if you recall, they've done this before. This is not their first time accusing Moses of something that he had no hand in. He has to deal with their animosity. He has to deal with these people. He has to deal with the death of his sister and on the heels of his death while he's grieving. His mind is on the good. His mind is on the bad. His mind is spinning in circles. Then he looks up and they don't have enough water. We'll see later enough water for them and their livestock. And they lay the blame at the feet of Moses. Moses has seen these people go from glorying to groaning in the span of a few minutes. In one hand, they're thanking God. On the other hand, now they're mad at God. In one hand, they praise the Lord. On the other hand, they're criticizing the man that the Lord gave them to lead them. They go from up to down in the blink of an eye. And let me tell you something for anyone that is in any portion of Christian service or just Christians in general. Ministry is a people business. And sometimes you deal with people, they're in a good mood. <laughs> sometimes you deal with people and they're not in a good mood. Sometimes you come to church and they meet you with a hug and thanking the Lord. And by the end of the sermon, the uh, but church, the sermon, worship, whatever, they'll walk by you and won't even speak. These are the type of people that Moses has had to deal with. And in our service, in our ministry, in our devotion to God, remember that ministry is a people do, uh, business. And in serving people, sometimes the people you serve, they can be kind. Sometimes the same people you serve can be not so kind. And as usual, we see an example in Jesus. In John chapter 13, remember when Jesus poured water into a basin, took off his clothes, girded himself with a towel, and began to wash and wipe the disciples' feet. And what I want you to know from John 13, when you read through it thoroughly, when he gets to Peter, and he, the point is he served them all. What, what I mean is he didn't skip over some to get to others. He washed the feet of all 12. And in that 12, you did have Judas. My point is, sometime in our service, we can serve with people, serve alongside people, or even serve people who are not the kindest, who may not be the nicest. They might not have our best interests at heart. But your service is not for man your service is for the Lord. You don't serve to get a pat on the back from people. You serve so that God sitting at the balconies of heaven can say, servant, well done. You've been faithful over a few things. Now come on up. I'll make you rulers over many. And in their complaint, as usual, they wished for death. This was a hopeless spirit. This was the spirit that because the temperature got high, because the pressure got high, because the sacrifice got high, they didn't hang in there and glory in tribulations like we talked about in our Sunday school lesson, Romans chapter five. 
They said, I'm going to throw in the white towel. I want to quit. I want to give up. They wished for death. And let me just tell you, listen, before we point a finger of disapproval at these Israelites, we've been there. <laughs> we've all contemplated throwing in the white towel. If you have not considered giving up, I question how long and how thorough you've been serving the Lord. Jeremiah not only thought about giving up, he did give up. And God called him back. Peter not only thought about quitting preaching, he did quit preaching. And in John 21, Jesus called him back. And if these towers of our faith, if these men who have been faithful, more faithful than you and I, these men who are authors of scripture, if they got so low, they wanted to say, forget it, I'm through, I'm done. You think you better? Let me talk to myself. Rodney, you think you better? The answer is no. I've been there. And I just believe if you're honest, there's somebody else on here. You've been there too. You ain't proud of it. You don't promote it. You don't lift it high and glory in it because there's nothing to be proud of. But if you're honest with yourself, we've all been there. We've all had the discouraging spirit. We've all been around people who are apathetic and careless and crude, and it began to rub off on us. We've all started with 20 people, and then you get three months down the road, you got 10 people. Then you get three more months down the road, you got two people. And then by the time you get to December, you're all by yourself, and you get frustrated. You get tired, and it makes you want to say, I'm done. So I think, before we criticize these Israelites, we wish we were dead. We should have left us in Egypt. Instead of looking through the window, look at the man in the mirror. But let me tell you something. What you don't know can hurt you. It's good to have a good memory. It's, it's good to remember how good as God has been to you. Remember what the Bible said. No weapon. I wish I had a few Bible readers on here. That's formed against you shall prosper. Remember what the psalmist said. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I Fear. Remember what the psalmist says when you got critics. Psalm 23, the 23rd number, verse 5. He'll prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I know they're trying to bring you down. I know they're criticizing you for having what they don't have. And the root of their criticism sometimes can be anger. It can be illegitimate envy or just plain old jealousy. But you know what God would do? God will bless you in their face. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Remember to let nothing separate you from the love of Christ because you will get discouraged. Serving will get hard. Serving some people can be difficult and strenuous and it will empty your spiritual tank. But remember what David said when he said, I've been young. I done mess around and got old now. I'm not looking through the window of life. I'm looking through the rear view mirror. I got more behind me than what's ahead of me if Deacon Gardner would say. I've been young and now I've messed around and then got old. And I, out of all the things I've seen, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So Moses has to go through a lot. The people are at a low point. Moses' mind is on the death of his brother. They had a checkered past, but yet he still loved them. No doubt he's grieving. He's hurting. He's sad. And then they have a shortage of water. It's like, Lord, you can't win for losing. And now that the shortage of water has come, the people criticize you and say, it's your fault. And let me tell you something. There's nothing more hurtful than being hurt along with the congregation of God's people. And the people that you love, the people that you respect, the people that you care for, because God has put you in the position to be out front, they take their anger out on you and say it's your fault. You, you're hurting from the shortage of water, just like they're hurting from the shortage of water. But when you are unjustly criticized, unjustly accused, and to top it off, you mingle that in with a grieving heart, a heavy heart, eyes may still be filled with tears. Moses is in a low place and they continue to complain. We wish we would have died. We wish you never would have brought us out of Egypt into this place that we are in. We, we, verse four, and why have you brought up this congregation of the Lord into the wilderness? 
that we and our cattle should die here. They, 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 they question his intentions. They, they, they question, did Moses do this to kill us? They, they, they question Moses by laying a vicious accusation at his feet. They say, Moses, you've done this to bring us out here to die. Now, 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 now listen, you got to understand, this has to hurt. I remember the bitter, sweet feeling that I had when we built this home. I remember. Was I happy? Yes, I was happy. We're moving from a house that was smaller than an apartment. I was thankful for it. But it signified a change that God was making. God had opened the door for us to go from a little bit of house to now my living room could almost fit the old the, the other home in. So was I happy not just to buy a house but to have a home built? Yes, I was happy. But I was sad at the same time. Well, why was I sad? Because I wanted us to have a house and I wanted New Hebron to have a church to go to. We were still in the gym. So on one hand, I'm thankful to God on the other hand, I felt so, I felt guilty. I said, God, I'm thankful for it, but my heart is so connected with the struggles of this congregation. I don't want us in the gym. I know you have your own sovereign plan, your own sovereign timetable, but I don't like preaching at the half court line. I don't like the secretaries typing inside the food counter. I don't like having Sunday school by the bumper pool table. I don't ha like having to move the chairs when the water come in. I don't like having to put out chairs and put up chairs. I don't like having the doors locked and we have to go by their schedule. As kind as St. John was to us, as good as Pastor C.D. Edwards and that church was to us, we still wanted a place of our own to do baptisms, a place of our own to have weddings, and yes, a place of our own to even have funerals. So on the one hand, I got one thing on one mind and another thing on the other side, it was bitter sweet. And then to think, now this didn't happen that I know of, if somebody said, it's Pastor Smith's fault that we in this gym. No. I can't imagine what Moses is going through. They didn't just accuse him of not going in the right direction. They laid a vicious accusation at his feet. They said he brought us out here to die. He tried to kill us. He trying to take us from stability to instability and watch us die out here. And then in verse five, and they said, wherefore or why have you made us to come up out of Egypt? Did you do it to bring us to this evil place? A place of no seed or vine or of pomegranates. The ground is not fertile, what that means. Neither is there any water to drink. They lay all this stuff Verse four and verse five at the feet of Moses. But if they would have thought about it, if they're in a hot climate with no water, Moses is also in a hot climate with no water. If they're in a land that's unfertile and they can't pl plant crops, that meant that Moses also is in a place where he can't plant crops. It wasn't as if they were in the desert of Zen. They were in this desert climate and Moses was in some plush living condition. No, he was right there along with them. So in that case, they should have hushed until they healed. Because the accusations they're bringing against Moses, if we just look at it and put it on the table, it was illogical. It was nonsensical. It didn't even make any good country sense. Why would he bring you out there to die? Because if you die, he'll die. Why would he bring you to an evil place? Because if you're there, he's there. Why would he bring you out there to dehydrate and die from the heat and uh, humidity? Because if you die from no water, guess what? If you don't have water, he don't have water either. What they were saying was illogical. But sometimes... People don't let illogical stuff, they don't let the truth of a situation stop them from a good complaining session. And you see how this was from the congregation of Israel. There should have been somebody in that congregation 
that was strong enough, mature enough, bold enough to say, wait, this doesn't make any sense. But yet, I'm sure there were people who heard it, who knew it didn't make any sense, but guess what? Held their peace. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about next Sunday, Lord willing, how your tolerance can sometimes be treason. When you see stuff going on and you allow stuff to go along, even if you don't say anything about it, just the fact that you don't stop it, you're not actively a peacemaker. You allowing sin to spread and you know better. There's a college in the Northeast that's called Penn State. Penn State had a coach on the staff, even won many awards, defensive coach, by the name of Jerry Sandusky. This Jerry Sandusky started a nonprofit organization that focused in on low-income children in high-crime areas. He used that organization as a means to cover his sexual assault. He took advantage of impoverished young children to the point to where he was routinely sexually assaulting young boys over a span of 15 or 20 years. Even to the point to where others on staff knew what he was doing and didn't say a word about it or did minimal things to bring it to an end. To the point where when he was finally arrested and convicted, he had 52 counts of sexual assault. Let me say this. He's bad. Horrible what he did. I hope the justice system gives him what the justice system deems to be appropriate for that type of situation. But do you know what's worse than the Jerry Sanduskies of the world? The people who know about it, who see it going on and sit on their hands. The people who know about it, who know it ain't right and turn the other cheek. And it's the same way when people say stuff and do stuff and accuse Moses and what Moses, what they're saying about Moses is illogical. The people who know it ain't true and don't say nothing are worse than the ones who even begin it. Can't you get to a point to where you mature enough to say that that don't even sound like Deacon so-and-so. He don't even talk like that. Can't you mature enough to say the Sunday school teacher, she, she, she don't steal. I mean, if she took something that belonged to you, it had to be by mistake. I know her. But when you hear that stuff, when you know what's being said is wrong, it's a lie, it don't even make good country sense, and you just turn the other cheek. You playing a part in more sin to go forward. Your tolerance of sin is treason before the Most High God. You mean nobody in this congregation Nobody in the Israelite camp, millions of people, nobody knew. That don't sound like Moses. Why would Moses bring us out here to die? What they levied against him was illogical. And they even said, you have brought us to what verse 5 calls an evil place. You brought us out here. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're going, where you're going. You're trying to kill us, and we hadn't even made it to Canaan. Because you got us wandering in this circle, in this evil place. Now, in essence, they call him ignorant. If you want to be nice, they can say he's being naive. If you want to be more specific and direct, they call him Moses stupid. And they call the place where they were an evil place. We're still wandering because of your naivete or your foolishness. But the real reason they were wandering had nothing to do with Moses. The real reason they were wandering is because of their rebellion against the Most High God. And so what does Moses do? His mind is confused. I'm sure he's hurt. He's got illogical but yet vicious accusations come in his place. He's dealing with the grief caused from the death of a sibling. He's got no water. The people are right for being in discomfort, but wrong for saying it's his fault. So he got all this stuff swimming in his mind. And Moses and Aaron, they left, verse 6, the assembly, the assembly 
and they went unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell on their faces and the glory cloud, the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Do you know what Moses did? Moses didn't say a word to the people. Moses didn't say a word to this person, to, to that person, to this tribe, to that tribe. Moses shut his mouth and stealed away. Now we can say he went to the door of the tabernacle, the fixed place of worship, the uh, temporary place that they would pack up and move whenever the glory cloud would move. Moses went to church. More specifically, Moses went down in prayer to the Lord. He talked to God about it. He laid everything at the foot of the master. He prayed about it. He shows great wisdom, and this is a noble reaction. He goes down to the Lord in prayer. He goes to God for help. Now, we can say where he did go and while at the same time describing where he didn't go. At the same time earlier, I said he didn't speak to them, didn't go to them. He went to the Lord. Do you know what he did? He went to get God's instruction. He went to get God's direction. He went to get God's comfort. He said, Lord, as I paraphrase the gist of probably the way he was feeling, he said, Lord, I need your help. I'm not strong enough because if I say something now, with this toxic combination of stuff in my head, grief, anger, frustration, disappointment, sadness, just plain old thirst. I'm going to say something I don't need to say. I might say the right thing, but with the wrong tone. I might say the right thing with the right tone, but with the wrong body language. God, I'm going to give off a signal that they're getting on my nerves. So help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And there's some good news. God answered. In verses 8, God gives him his response. Let me just tell you something right now. The seniors would say it this way. When you call him and you call him right, he hears and answers our prayers. This is a beautiful thing to know that we can take our concerns to the Lord. He lays everything at the foot of the master. And when we have a problem, and guess what? We will have them. When we have a situation, a storm, when we've gone from the mountaintop of good times to the valley of hardships, take your concerns to the Lord. Not, not, not so much your friends. Not so much getting on the cell phone. You ain't got to talk about everything at the water cooler, telling all your business to people at work. You don't have to post it on social media. You can go to a God that's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think about. Moses trusted that God would see him through. He goes to God in prayer. And God, in verses 7 and 8, God gives him clear direction. Verse 7, it says God spoke. In verse 8, we can see what God spoke. Take your rod, get the people together. Speak unto the rock in front of them, and the rock is going to obey you. It's going to give water for you, and it's going to bring water for the congregation and their livestock. Get your rod. Well, what is the rod? The rod is the rod that was dead, but God caused buds to come off of a dead rod. This is the rod that validated the authority of Moses. That situation took place in Numbers chapter 17. It validated the authority of Moses, the leadership of Moses. Call to mind, remind them that you are in this position, not because you put yourself there, but because I put you there. Call them to remind themselves when they see that rod. Remember when they tried to overthrow your leadership and said, who can speak for, for God? Can't we speak for God? We're just as authoritative and smart and spiritual as Moses is. And they probably were. There could have been many people that were smarter, closer to God, that knew more about the Old Testament than Moses did. But the problem is God didn't choose them. He chose Moses. So take the rod that budded and get the people together. Take your rod, and I want you to gather together the assembly. That when I do what I'm going to do, I want all eyes on me. I want all eyes in front of you. The people will see 
firsthand what I'm going to do. Get the rod, get the people together, and then I want you to speak to the rock. Well, speak to the rock. All Moses had to do was follow God's instructions. All Moses had to do was be obedient, and God was going to bless. God gave him a specific means, a specific instruction, a specific guideline to follow. And God said, follow this if you want to have the blessing that I'm going to give. Now listen, Moses prayed. His mind is confused, is upset. He's frustrated, disappointed, angry. He goes to God and God said, here's what you're going to do. And Moses, verse 9, took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. From before the Lord, that means he took it from the tabernacle. He took it from before the holies of holy. He took it from it. They also had a jar of manna in there. He took it from the church. And then we see verse 10, a change. God told him what to do. And Moses didn't do it. And Moses and Aaron gathered together the congregation before the rock. Okay, sound good. And he said unto them, stop right there. He just deviated from what God said do. He just got off track. Nowhere in the congregation does God tell him to speak to the people. Now, of course, they had to generally call the people together. But that's not what we're, what we're referring to. God said, when you call them together, you don't have a word to say to them. You just hold the rod and you speak to the rock. And we see right here in verse 10, the people came before the rock. He gathered them together and he spoke to the people. And what did he do? The anger came up. He shouldn't have been talking to him in the first place. You never would have said what you said if you would have been doing what God told you to do. God says, speak to the rock. Moses does the opposite. He speaks to the people. And guess what he does? He degrades God's people. Were they rebellious? Yes. I mean, they just called him stupid. They just called him ignorant. They accuse him of trying to kill him. They say it's your fault we're in this evil place. They say it's your fault we don't have no water. Were they rebelling and rebellious? Yes. But this wasn't time for him to say that. This was a time where if he was going to speak, he should have been speaking what thus saith the Lord in the way that God told him to do it. He said, here now, you rebels. Do we always got to fetch water out of this rock? And he lifted up his hand and he hit the rock, not once, but twice. Nowhere in the instructions in verse eight does God say hit the rock. He doesn't tell him to hit anything with the rod. The rod is only a visible reminder to validate his authority, his spiritual authority in front of the people. It is not to be used as a battering ram against the rock. Moses is in complete disobedience. And even though he disobeyed, not once, but twice, then we see on the end of that, the grace of God. And the water didn't just come out. The water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank. And their beast, livestock, animals also. Now, now th th this is confusing and we're about to close here. Did Moses hear God clearly? Yes. Well, did God speak clearly? Yes. Well, why did he do something different than what God told him to do? Good question. Did God tell you in his word what to do? Yes. Did you understand from his word what he told you to do? Yes. Then ask yourself a question. Why are you doing something different? If he told you you should do this, if he told you you should not do this, if he told you you should talk this way, if he told you you shouldn't talk this way, and you can read it for yourself and you understand it clearly, then why did you do something opposite of what God says do? Sinfulness. Haven't you been where Moses is? Haven't you been where those people are? 
Haven't you falsely accused people? Haven't you allowed gossip and lies to tear down somebody's character and you knew it wasn't true, but you turned your head? All of this is us. Moses disobeyed. Well, if he disobeyed, why did the water come out? Seem to me that when you disobey, God spank you behind and you don't get water. Well, there's something that God gives us. There's something that God does to us. I think the Bible calls it grace. God is not blessing his disobedience. God is not saying you did right. I was wrong. Your idea was better than mine. Now, that can happen to me. That can happen to you. That can happen to all of us. You thought you were right. Somebody's idea was better than yours. None of us have a way that's better than God's. The Bible even says it, says it this way. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof will always lead you to death. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's supposed to do or what we're supposed to do. God says the right thing at the right time. His prescriptions are always true and right, irrespective of what's going on in the world. The world will make you think God's way is wrong and the world's way is right. That's a fool's errand. There's many people who thought the world's way was proper and this old Bible stuff is wrong. The graveyard's full of a whole bunch of them. The jails are filled with a whole bunch of them. There's people walking the streets right now who thought their way was better than God's way. So God's way was right. God was not blessing Moses' disobedience. He was just giving him grace because sometimes... Walk with me here. God doesn't mistake the man for the moment. Yeah, it was a bad moment. Yeah, you did wrong. But guess what? I'm going to bless you in spite of you. Now, I'm not going to take 20 more minutes to talk about that because I could. How many times has God blessed you in spite of your actions? Blessed you in spite of your decisions? I told you to leave that man alone. I told you to stay away from that woman. I've shown you sign. You asked me and I showed you sign after sign after sign. They're not good. They're not right. They don't love God. She don't honor God. He don't go to church. He don't read his Bible. He don't pray. If he can't follow God, how can he lead you? I showed you God could be hypothetically saying, and you still chose to do the wrong thing. Sometimes it's by God's grace. That person, I'm just going to stick to stick with the analogy of a relationship. This applies to many other areas of life. Sometimes God told you to leave that person alone and you still didn't do it. And you know what God graciously does? He gives you grace to hang in there. And then the ultimate thing God can do, the person that you've been sacrificing for, then they'll leave you. Pause. It hurts you because you compromised your character and they still left you. But guess what? You better thank God for his blessing. Because God knows you didn't have the strength to leave that person. So guess what he did? He caused the other person to find somebody on the other side of the fence. Now that hurts you. Hurts your pride. Hurts your ego. It's almost as if you lost a competition. Now you didn't lose something. You won something. You better get yourself back in church and thank God that he took that no good man away. Thank God he took that money-grubbing, uh, greedy woman away. You better thank God that he removed that person from your life that should not be there. Now, that applies to many other situations. We're just sticking with the analogy of a relationship. God blesses us in spite of us. Because I could tell you a list of A to Z things that I knew I shouldn't have did. Got myself in a hole. Went calling on God. And God said, uh-huh, I told you. And guess what? He pulled me out of it. God blesses us like that as an extension of his grace. Because when you've been your worst, yes, and you expect the hand of God to come down, you're just looking up like, here it comes, because you deserve it. He's been working with you. And guess what? Instead of punishing you, now this is at God's own, uh, own pleasure. He does it when he wants to whom he wants. So don't go banking on this every time. But when you expect him to punish you because you deserve it, he'll embrace you. Sometimes he'll hold you. Sometimes he'll give you something a little extra. And you know what God does in that moment? God will love you out of your sin. He will love you out of your wayward ways. He will love you out of your sinful ways. And here God did that. He didn't mistake the people 
or not mistake the people, hurt the people because of a foolish decision of a leader. And guess what? He still allowed Moses to have water come through the rock. But when you read the rest of the chapter, he says, Moses, me, you need to talk. He said, verse 12, because you didn't believe me, the root of why he disobeyed was in disbelief. Verse 12, because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, you have forfeited the right to lead this congregation into the land of Canaan. Well, yes, there is a portion of to whom much is given, much is required. But let me come another way. And we're going to close with this. Be careful when you play with sin, disobedience, transgressions, iniquity, sin, rebellion. Be careful playing in the pond, the cesspool of sin. Because sometimes sin can cost you things that you can't get back. You may never be able to lead your child again. You abandoned your child. You left your child to be raised by your parents. Why? Because you was ready for sex, but you wasn't ready for a baby. A baby going to stop your clubbing. A baby going to stop your dating. A baby going to stop you from going out. It, 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 it hinders you. A child is a restriction from your quote unquote fun. So yeah, you let them be raised by coaches and deacons and preachers and Sunday school teachers and grandparents and aunts and uncles, and then one day you're going to get old. And guess what? You can't be 60 years old and they're dropping it like it's hot in elevation, 145th. You can't be on the club on quarter note, 50-yard line. Uh-uh, no, no, you're too old now. Your knees won't let you get down. And if your knees let you get down, you can't get back up. Now the stuff that you forfeited, you want it back. I want to be a mother to my daughter, to my son. I, I'm, I'm through with the drugs. Now I want to come back to my daughter. I, I, I'm, I'm through running the streets. Now I want to come back to my son. And guess what? Your son or your daughter, they may be loving, they may be kind, but you can never have that bond that you have forsaken. You may never have that unity that you so desire. The point is not that God is being harsh. The point is that sometimes when you play with sin, sin sometimes can cost you things you can't get back. The point is, don't play with it. Don't, don't, don't do it. And Moses here, somebody can make a case. After all he did, I mean, he just messed up. What? Listen, God's punishment is at his uh, own pleasure. God gives you the choice on the front end to obey or disobey. You choose to obey or disobey. You don't choose your punishment. The punishment is levied out by God. You can choose to obey the law or to break the law. You can't choose what that sentence the judge is going to give you. It can be four years minimum or 25 year maximum. But guess what? If it gives you 25 years, your choice was at the beginning, not at the trial. Your choice was in the streets, not at the courtroom. Your choice is at the beginning to obey or disobey. And if you choose to disobey, you can't choose your punishment. So we could say, give him another chance. God can say, no, I'm just. I love him. I care for him. But Moses didn't learn to hush before he healed. So people, watch what you say. Don't let the gossip of the day make you ruin somebody's character. Don't let lies that don't even make sense cause you to propagate it and you know it ain't true. Don't say something out of anger or emotion that if your head was more level and you were thinking clearly, you wouldn't say it. Now, we've all done it. I wish I could say I never have, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. But we have to learn to hold our peace and if you trust God, he'll give you the discipline to do that. And if you're not a Christian, then you don't have the power to do this. Only through faith in Christ and maturing as a Christian can you learn the discipline and get the wisdom, the strength to be able to do this. So let me introduce you to a man by the name of Jesus who lived for 33 years. And one Friday he died. And early that Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Your salvation is based on your belief in the biblical account that Jesus shed his blood for your sins, paid for them, and you receive salvation by your faith in Christ. We're going back to Romans chapter 5, our Sunday school lesson. If you've made a mistake, you've messed up, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe that God has 
Praise him for, oh, if you confess with your mouth, you confess with your mouth your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I appreciate your time for today. I pray that somebody has come to know Jesus. If you want prayer, if you want more information, if you want to let us know that you've given your life to Christ, please visit us at newhebronlr.org, and we'd love to hear from you. God bless you. God keep you as my prayer. And until we meet again, I pray that you stay safe and keep your hand in God's hand.